so much. My name is Richard Gage, AIA. I've been a practicing architect for 20 years, and I'm a member of the American Institute of Architects. I became interested in the World Trade Center high-rise collapses on 9-11 after hearing the startling conclusions of a reluctant 9-11 researcher, David Ray Griffin, on San Francisco Bay Area's KPFA radio, Guns and Butter, with Bonnie Faulkner in March of 2006. This has changed my life radically and launched my own personal and professional quest for 9-11 truth, inspiring me to found architects and engineers for 9-11 truth. We're proud to be a part of the international 9-11 truth movement, which is growing by millions every year. We now have hundreds of architects and engineers for 9-11 truth demanding a real investigation. This is our website. You can find on the right side the bullet points of information that we're going to be going through today. It's ae911truth.org. On the left side, you'll see the PowerPoint. You can step through it at your own pace because you may not have time to follow and read all the text and absorb the information that we're rapidly going to be going through. You can also watch the DVD on the left side, and you can purchase the DVD, of course, online. You can sign the petition after you find yourself convinced. The ever-growing number of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth are not conspiracy theorists. We're building and technical professionals looking at the science-based forensic evidence in the destruction of these high-rises on 9-11. First, let the technical truths emerge. Then, if necessary, cope with the inevitable conspiracy and other questions. Tonight, we're presenting to you the technical truths, the evidence found for the explosive demolition of all three World Trade Center high-rise collapses on 9-11, the iconic Twin Towers and the mysterious Building 7. Let's begin with an overview of the events of that morning in order to start us off on the same page, looking at the jets and the impacts and how this myth developed. On September 11th, we learned that four passenger planes were hijacked and taken radically off course. Within an hour, two of the planes had flown into the enormous steel towers of the World Trade Center, creating fires and eventually toppling them. Dazed by the news, the American public soon believed the fires in the towers had burned so hot they caused the steel frames of the buildings to give way. A myth developed, fed by official sources through the media to a bewildered audience. Elements of the myth. The impact of the airplanes, gallons of burning jet fuel, steel melting, the buildings failing and suddenly imploding. In a mere 10 seconds, 110 stories hurtled earthward, pulverizing into dust. We ran into the building, it went into the right from the start, on the street itself, the official story was born. Come out of nowhere and just Green right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. The myth bled into the FEMA report and was echoed by the experts. It was the combination of the impact load doing great damage to the building, followed by the fire that caused collapse. Well, let's take a look at that. Buildings are destroyed by a number of different forces, each of which have very different and identifiable characteristics. For instance, fires affect buildings quite differently than controlled demolitions. Fires, by their nature, tend to creep from place to place. As they run out of fuel, moving to fresh new fuel sources, leaving the burned out area to cool. So when collapses do occur, and by the way, you'll note that they've never occurred in over a hundred examples of very hot, very large, and very long-lasting fires, buildings tend to fall over. They, they fall asymmetrically. They're burned out on one side organically, if you will. It's a natural process. They don't fall straight down through the path 
of greatest resistance. These particular buildings collapsed. They followed the path of least resistance, or they fell over. You can see that the building structure holds the building together in some recognizable form. The structural elements have not been dismembered from each other, and their concrete is not pulverized to dust. They follow the path of least resistance, which is generally over. These buildings exploded. Witnesses hear sounds of explosions. They see flashes of light. There's thick, billowing, and enormous pyroclastic clouds of pulverized concrete. The expansion of the gases very quickly produces this cauliflower-like formation that we see in the smoke. This is a controlled demolition. Let's focus on this type of destruction first. We have hundreds of examples from all across the country from which to make our comparison because it's the most commonly used method to demolish high-rises. This is what a high-rise looks like when it's being demolished with explosives. Let's take a look at some of the key characteristics of controlled demolition. First, we have a sudden onset of destruction at the base of the structure. We have straight down symmetrical collapse into its own footprint. Because demolition waves remove the column support, resulting in a free fall speed, virtually, through the path of what was the greatest resistance, thousands of tons of structural steel. We have a total dismemberment of the steel structure, so it's ready for shipment. We have minimal damage to adjacent structures, sounds and flashes of explosions heard and seen by witnesses, enormous clouds of pulverized concrete, squibs sometimes, explosive charges that go off at the wrong times, chemical evidence of cutter charges. These are all fairly typical, and they go to show us direct evidence of explosive destruction. Now, the interesting thing is that not one of these typical characteristics of controlled demolition can be explained or accounted for by fire, let alone all ten of them. Typically, we'll have government documentation, expert corroboration, foreknowledge, and video documentation, all of which supports the hypothesis of controlled demolition, providing proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's take a look at World Trade Center 7 now. It was 47 stories tall, what would have been the tallest building in 33 of our states, half the height of the Twin Towers, dwarfed only by its proximity to what was, for a couple of years, the tallest buildings in the world. It was not hit by an airplane. It was the third World Trade Center high-rise to collapse on 9-11 at about 5.20 in the afternoon. World Trade Center 7 was hit by debris from the North Tower. You can see it being pelted here. And it sustained about eight fires, according to NIST, on various floors. This is the World Trade Center 7, 47 stories high. Don't be confused by the shadow from this building. Here we have the 12th and 13th floor fires and the 7th floor fire on the north side of the building, the opposite side of the building that was being pelted by the North Tower. Now let's take a look at the evidence of World Trade Center 7 and see how it stacks up against the typical features of a controlled demolition, starting with, is there a sudden onset of destruction? Let's listen to this emergency word. We were watching the building actually because it was on fire, the, uh, the bottom floors of the, the building were on fire, and uh, you know, we heard this, this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder. Turned around, we were shocked to see that the building was... Uh, uh, well, it looked like there was um, a shock wave uh, ripping through the building and the windows all uh, busted out and, you know, it was, it was horrifying. And then, uh, you know, about a second later, the bottom floor caves out and uh, the building followed after that and um, we saw the building crash down all the way to the ground. A sound of a clap of thunder, a shock wave ripping through the building and windows busting out and then the building coming down. Do we have a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint? Let's listen to Dan Rather narrate this collapse for us as we take our first look at the collapse of Building 7. And what you're seeing are high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. Mm. 
It's amazing. A, a, amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. What, Dan? Deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down? Dan never repeated these words after this first day. In fact, we didn't see this building coming down after 9-11. Let's take a look in this side-by-side -side comparison with a known controlled demolition on the right. Did the building fall into its own footprint? Pretty much so, a little bit of overlapping into the street. Do we have demolition waves? And how do these remove the column support? Well, here's a floor plan of building seven. Now, to bring a building smoothly, symmetrically, into its own footprint without falling over, what we have to do is remove the core columns. Because what we want to do is bring the outside of the building in on itself. Now this involves a high degree of precision that fire is not capable of. Do we have a free fall speed of collapse through the path of greatest resistance? You can see second by second the building gaining downward momentum. You can plot the drop distance on a graph of time and it fits the free fall curve almost perfectly. What does this mean? That the columns had to have been removed and removed virtually simultaneously on each floor synchronistically timed so the building had no resistance virtually on the way down. Do we have a total dismemberment of the steel structure? We had a 47-story skyscraper compressed to four stories. How does this happen? Do we have sounds of explosions, though? How about Kevin McPadden? He came back over with his hand over the radio, and it sounded like a countdown. And at the last few seconds, he took his hand off, and you heard three, two, one, and he was just saying, just run for your life, just run for your life. And then it was like another two, three seconds, you heard explosions, like ba boom. It has like a distinct sound. It's not like when in compression, like boom, 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 like floors that were dropping and collapsing. This was a boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. Do we have enormous clouds of pyroclastic smoke from the pulverized concrete? Watch the concrete entrained in the air racing down every street in each direction at 35 miles an hour. This incredible volume of pyroclastic dust and folding itself. It takes incredible quantities of heat to create this kind of action. A lot more heat than the eight various fires that were on these floors. Do we have pools of molten iron? Let's start with the South Tower now. This section applies to the World Trade Center Twin Towers and Building 7. We're told by NIST that this substance must be melted aluminum from the airplane. But melted aluminum looks like melted aluminum. <laughs> it's silvery. It doesn't uh, glow in daylight conditions. As of 21 days after the attack, the fires were still burning and molten steel was still running, says World Trade Center structural engineer Leslie Robertson to a conference of structural engineers on October 5th, 2001, one month after 9-11. Fires burned, molten metal flowed in the pile of ruins, still settling beneath my feet. Well, what do the first responders and the demolition contractors say about molten metal. Saw pools of literally molten steel. Molten metal beams had just been totally melted. It was dripping from the molten steel. Steel flowed in molten streams. They're finding molten steel. 
And this structural engineer, Abu Hazan Astani from Berkeley, cites and documents, I saw melting of girders in the World Trade Center. One of the more unusual artifacts to emerge from the rubble is this rock-like object that has come to be known as the meteorite. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat. And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. Here is building seven at A and B and here is the North Tower and the South Tower. These hot spots are 1340 to 1370 degrees. These are the temperatures of the hottest office fires. There was no fire on the surface of ground zero after the collapses. What are we measuring here? We're measuring the molten metal that was seen by these first responders four, five, six stories down below in the basements that was surely at least twice or three times these temperatures. What's the problem with that? Office fires, Eager says uh, 1200 degrees, uh, NIST claims 1800 degrees for which we have no evidence for office fires uh, of that temperature in the Trade Center towers. Structural steel doesn't even begin to melt until 2700 or so degrees. We're missing a thousand to two thousand degrees of temperature, heat energy required to produce this stuff. Where is it coming from? We'll be taking a look at a possible suspect, thermite, which reaches temperatures of 4,500 degrees. Let's listen to John Gross, lead engineer of NIST, tell us about the molten metal from his perspective. First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who has said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, like a molten bit. steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Lava. Like, like, lava lava. Volcano. No eyewitness who said so. There actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. No eyewitness who said so. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped on the sides of a wall. No eyewitness who said so. The piece of metal that's draped over was molten metal. No eyewitness who said so. I saw pools of literally molten steel. Nobody who's produced it. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel. I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who has said so, nobody who's produced it. Nobody who's produced it. NASA pictures, thermal images showed those sorts of temperatures in the basement. What is the problem here? Somebody's lying. I'm going to leave it up to you to make your own conclusions. How about chemical evidence, though? Where, where, what's, what produced all this molten metal? And what is thermite anyway? Thermite. An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel but metal had melted at the base of the towers. Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. Dr. Stephen Jones performed chemical analysis on the previously molten metal. He sent a sample from this 40-pound chunk of previously molten metal from one of those meteorites. He finds that it's predominantly iron, so we can rule out aluminum from the jet plane. It has small amounts of aluminum, sulfur, and potassium and manganese and fluorine in abundance. Manganese is from the potassium permanganate, commonly used as an oxidizer in thermite. Fluorine 
is also used in sol gel type thermite charges. So these appear to be the thermite fingerprint. Gel explosives are a super thermite, tiny aluminum particles in iron oxide in this sol gel. They can be cast into shape. They're like a clay. Lawrence Livermore Lab did research on this, and this invention offers a thermite-based apparatus for cutting target materials. You pack the thermite in here, and you ignite it, and it comes out and is forced through melting the structural steel element in fractions of a second, uh, almost as effective as uh, high-energy explosives, RDX and C4, which are more common in classic controlled demolitions. If sol gels were used, they would leave behind a very unique signature, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Uh, and in fact, EPA finds one molecule in their toxicological studies at levels that dwarfed all others, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Eric Schwartz says we've never observed it in any other sampling we've ever done. But is there evidence of thermite in the World Trade Center dust? Dr. Jones received no less than four separate samples of World Trade Center dust, some of it from Jeanette McKinley's apartment across the street, where the windows blew in and filled her apartment with dust. Another sample was found uh, like 10 minutes later on the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, he takes this and he puts a magnet over it, and he finds that there are small particles that come up to the magnet. Some of them are angular, some of them are round. They look like this. In fact, he calculates by the weight of the amount of these spheres that he finds in the dust that there must have been about 10 tons for, the whole, for all of the dust that was available. They're about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, the largest ones, and most of them, though, are smaller than a human hair. What could produce such an incredible array of microspheres? Well, if you had thousands of cutter charges going off in the columns and beams throughout the building, and they were, they were under this incredible pressure, what you'd see is something like this. Tens of thousands or millions of tiny droplets. What's the shape of those droplets? When a liquid is dispersed like this, its surface tension forms itself into almost a perfect sphere. In the case of molten iron, that those droplets cool and they fall along with the dust everywhere. We have iron, manganese, and in, in the case of uh, this known thermite signature, it, it matches basically. In other words, we have a controlled experiment to compare the results against. Dr. Jones is not the only one who finds these iron-rich microspheres. The EPA finds them in all the dust and the toxicological studies they're doing. They have no idea where they came from. They sweep it under the rug. It has only one possible formation, and that is from liquid molten iron under extreme pressure. R.J. Lee finds the iron-rich microspheres on top of the Deutsche Bank building in their toxicological studies. Well, Dr. Jones concludes that given the mix of trace metals present in these high concentrations uh, in the dust, such as zinc, copper, manganese, and the formation of iron-rich aluminum spheres, it's clear that significant aluminothermic reactions occur, and he can reverse engineer this and suggest to us that there must have been in the thermite mix powders of aluminum, iron oxide, copper oxide, zinc nitrate, and potassium permanganate. Well... Would there possibly be any unignited thermite pieces in the World Trade Center dust? Indeed, he finds it. It also comes up to the magnet from his dust samples. Many chips. This one, a sixteenth of an inch long, red on one side, gray on the other. The red side is composed of tiny iron oxide particles and, and aluminum. In fact, he does an XEDS on this stuff too, and he finds a little bit of sulfur, more aluminum, lots of iron, and manganese. And compare that to the traditional thermite. It's also a match for unignited thermite. This stuff is not made in a cave in Afghanistan. The Lawrence Livermore Lab came out with papers only a year or two ago about this stuff. 
the particles being so small allow for almost instantaneous ignition between the two chemicals, the aluminum and the iron oxide, producing very explosive results. Los Alamos lab and Lawrence Livermore lab have produced these results. Then he continues his study and finds additional chips that are partially ignited with spheres embedded in them, indicating that the source of the spheres is, for all intents and purposes, identified very clearly. With Dr. Jones and his small team of scientists, through EDS, XRF, and WDS, identifies the components of these spheres and chips, predominantly iron, along with aluminum, oxygen, silicon, 1,3-diphenylpropane, the results coupled with the visual evidence, he says, at the scene, such as the flowing hot liquid metal, providing compelling evidence that thermite reaction compounds were deliberately placed in both World Trade Center towers and Building 7. These results are documented in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, all of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction in Building 7. We'll come jump back to only Building 7 now. Now, none of these characteristics can be explained by fire, let alone all of them. Let's listen to what FEMA did conclude, because it is interesting. Evidence of a severe high-temperature corrosion attack on the steel, including rapid oxidation, sulfidation, and subsequent intergranular melting. Very interesting. Remember, office fires don't melt steel. What melted this steel? Sulfur formed during this hot corrosion attack on the steel. Here is the intergranular melting documented for all of us. Thank you. Capable of turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese, like this former wide flange column from the structural steel in Building 7. Now, they document this very carefully in their Appendix C. The specifics of the fires in World Trade Center 7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown at this time. What? Unknown? The best hypothesis, fire plus random damage, and then complete collapse, has only a low probability of occurrence. Further research, investigation, and analysis are, are needed to resolve this issue. But unfortunately, for those hoping to resolve the issue, much of that evidence had already been destroyed, about 99% of it, in fact, by FEMA. In fact, 800 truckloads a day. Easily, the, thir the three worst structural failures in modern history. 250 pieces were saved. Crucial evidence that could answer the questions is on the slow boat to China, exclaims Bill Manning, editor-in-chief of the 125-year-old Fire Engineering magazine, that brings together fire protection engineers to communicate with each other, showing an astounding ignorance of the government officials to the value of a thorough scientific investigation. The destruction and removal of evidence must stop immediately. Commission a fully resourced blue ribbon panel to conduct a clean and thorough investigation. How about expert corroboration? How about Danny Juenko, 27-year controlled demolitions expert? It starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. It's controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. It's professional work, without a doubt. Building 7, do we have any foreknowledge of its destruction? Listen to these construction workers walking away from Building 7 and this police officer caught on CNN camera. We are walking back. It's a building about to blow up. All flame, debris coming down. And how about Kevin McPadden? What did he say? At the last few seconds, he took his hand off, and you heard three, two, one. Countdown? Does that imply foreknowledge? Do fires bring buildings down? To countdowns? <laughs> Unlikely. In fact, the BBC announces the collapse 20 minutes before it happened. It's true. Jane Stanley is here announcing it. She says the 47-story Solomon Brothers building close to the World Trade Center has also collapsed. And there it is standing behind her. 
The BBC apologizes for this grievous error, citing the confusing events of the day. <laughs> but does that make them psychic? <laughs> Unlikely. Is there some kind of script that's handed out, like the guy on the street, uh, the Twin Towers who had all the answers? I believe we've shown that Building 7 matches all of the features of controlled demolition in the classic sense. Is it likely that Al-Qaeda could have had access to this building, which had to have been one of the most secure outside the Pentagon? If they didn't, then who did? The evidence is even more clear in the case of the Twin Towers. It's generally more difficult for people to understand that the towers were a controlled demolition because it was so outside of our frame of reference. We'd never seen anything like this. So this combined with the shock uh, kept us from being objective. But if you were to plan a fire-induced collapse as a result of airplanes, you'd start the explosions at the point of jet plane impacts. So in World Trade Center 2 and 1, we have all of the key characteristic features of controlled demolitions, but with some of these key differences. We have a beginning of detonation at the point of jet plane impacts, not at the base of the building. In addition, we have not an implosion, but where everything is being exploded outside the footprint. We have squibs, or these mistimed explosions. And as we already discussed the evidence for thermite uh, in the molten metal and in the dust in the iron-rich microspheres, so let's take a look, starting with the sudden onset. What is the evidence for this, and how is it produced? Produced by these sounds and flashes from the explosion. 118 of these firefighters witnessed sounds and flashes of explosions. We felt the ground shake. You could see the tower sway, and then it just came down. All of a sudden, the ground just started shaking. It shook my bones. Shortly before the first tower came down, I remember feeling the ground shaking. Somewhere around the middle of the World Trade Center, there was this orange and red flash coming out. Initially, just one flash. Then it just kept popping all the way around the building. The building had started to explode. It's like on television, they blow up these buildings. It seemed like it was going all the way around, like a belt. All these explosions. Pop, pop, pop. That's when I heard the building coming down. Saw a brief number of light sources being emitted from inside the building between Floors 10 and 15. I saw low-level flashes. We actually heard the pops. You know, you heard the pops of the building. It was blowing out on all four sides. What did these guys experience? We started running. Four by four, it started popping out. It was, like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, as detonated. If they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. How about the news reporters? What do they say? They tend to tell the truth on the first day, and then we don't hear that truth again. What happens to it? Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under-infrastructure of a building and bring it down. The entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off. When you see the old demolitions of these old buildings, it's My folded God. down on itself, and it is not there anymore. I heard a second explosion and another rumble. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. And all of a sudden, it was this big explosion. There was another big, big explosion. An hour later than that, we had that big explosion from much, much lower. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like, it, it, to me, it sounded like an explosion, but it was a huge explosion. Chief Albert Turry said that there was another explosion which took place, and then an hour after, there was another explosion in one of the towers here. So according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. It just went ba-boom, it was like a bomb went off, and another explosion came right from it, just everyone flying. Like, it sounded like gunfire, you know, bang, 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 and then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. I was about five blocks away when that, I heard uh, explosions, three thuds. There was a uh, heavy-duty explosion. Again, none of these explosions are a part of the official story. Now, compare these explosions uh, to a known explosion on, on, the, on the left here. Upward 
outward arching streamers, pyroclastic volumes of dust, symmetrical display like a mushroom. Does it look like a gravitational collapse to you? Let's look at the North Tower now. What I want to point out to you is that you're going to see some explosions up at the top of the building, curiously enough. And what's going to happen is this entire section is going to telescope such that half of it, its upper half, is destroyed before there's any movement from the jet plane impacts down. Let's take a look. Here's the first evidence of explosion, and then over here, and then the collapse. Of course, the violent clouds which are emerging even prior to the collapse. We're going to take a close-up look after this second look new fuel source, which very well might be jet fuel that wasn't burned, it's getting new oxygen. Let's take a look now closer up. Right away, we're seeing clouds forming up here. Well, wait, the collapse is supposed to be just down here. But we have asymmetrical damage to this building, right? The plane went in one side, and yet this complete symmetrical uh, collapse, we'll use in quotes from now on, and let's keep going. Unexpected. Too. And one Many more time. In terms of how it Belts, just like the firemen saw, all happened. the way around the building. They came down. The antenna falls Many first before anything else falls, indicating core column damage first. Now take a look at this from the same tower from the bottom, noting the violence underneath the mushroom cloud. The, the collapse is supposed to be occurring way up here, but down below, as you'll see in this second run, incredible quantities of, of squibs, explosions bursting out. And on the third time, I'd like to direct your attention to this racing series of explosions down the right side in the corner of this building about 40 stories below the collapsing building. It gets painfully obvious after a while, doesn't it? Do we have a straight down symmetrical progression of collapse outside the footprint? We had a 207 foot wide building. FEMA tells us, and you can see in this document, that we have a 1200 foot debris field, equidistant around each tower. Asymmetrical damage, symmetrical distribution, all through the site, in fact, and beyond. Do we have squibs or these mistimed explosions? Some believe that these might be appropriately timed explosions. Whatever. In all the videos of the collapses, explosions can be seen bursting from the building 20 to 30 stories below the demolition wave. Here. here, 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 here. And here. Now NIST tells us that these are puffs of air being produced by the collapsing building pushing air down the hoistway like a piston. It's got to come out somewhere, right? Well, first of all, these are not puffs of air. They're pulverized building materials. And they occur at 160 to 200 feet, some of them, per second. These velocities are propelled by explosives. 20, 40, and 60 stories below. How can the piston be producing all of that? And in, in fact, there, there are these focalized ejections that occur halfway between the corners of the building. Also, if, say this was the open office spa space, right, 60 feet long. The elevator hoistways over here. The, the piston's going to shove the air into this room. It's going to fill and the, the room 
fairly uniformly with air pressure before it breaks any windows, right? And then it might break several, but not these highly focalized, uh, pinpoint accurate, uh, geometrically precise, violent ejections. Do we have a near freefall pace through the path of greatest resistance? Let's take a look. Galileo's law of falling bodies calculates the time in which an object will travel a certain distance in complete freefall. Distance, d, equals 16.8 times time in seconds squared. The South Tower was 1,362 feet tall. 1362 equals 16.08 times 84.7, or 9.2 seconds. The Twin Towers came down in nearly free fall speed. What are we talking about here? Let's just try to put this in perspective with this story problem. We have a 15-story building which we hold with this crane over 95 stories of nothing but air. No resistance, right? Just air resist. Next to it, another 15-story building held over a 95-story building with, say, 80,000 tons of structural steel in it. Now we're going to pull the lever on these cranes and drop them both at once. I brought a 95-story building with me today. And we're going to just test this theory of NIST's. I've got two 15-story buildings. We've got 80,000 tons of structural steel in this one right here. And we've got air resistance here. So let's try it, okay? We'll put them both up here. We'll even give a little bit of impact load too, okay? Ready? Three, two, one. Oh my God! The one without any resistance under it hit the ground first at virtually free fall speed. This doesn't take much, does it? What happened over here? The, the building above was... It met resistance. Through the, process, the energy of deformation, it came to a halt. Where is the 15-story building that was driving this building down to the ground at free fall speed? In the first two seconds, you saw it reduce half of its mass. It was blown outside. It couldn't have been used to influence the downward progression of the building. In the next two seconds, after four seconds totally, it's destroyed itself. There's nothing crushing the building. It's tearing itself apart at free fall speed. And it's dismembering the steel structure. In fact, the leading edge of these mushroom clouds are full of perimeter columns, aluminum cladding, and other steel. Let's take a look at the South Tower in terms of dismemberment. See what's going on here. South Tower's on your left. It was hit lower by the aircraft. And as you can see, its rapid destruction starts there and it begins to tilt to the left. and it disappears into this cloud. We would expect to see this building, which is already tilted at 22 degrees and continuing its angular momentum, off-center of the building below it. How can it crush it symmetrically at free-fall speed when it's already off-center? We don't see it either mangled up in some heap at the bottom uh, down on the pavement. It's been completely dismembered. Let's take a look from below, though. We have asymmetrical damage, and yet there's this symmetrical destruction occurring underneath the cloud, all the way around the building like the firemen saw, even though this top mass has already fallen over. Free fall speed. Doesn't make sense to me. Steel frame structure was completely dismembered. There are no large chunks of building, only those shards that we saw of the perimeter structure. Does it look like a gravitational collapse to you? Do we have a lateral ejection of structural steel? Let's take a look. Now let's look at the collapse of the Twin Towers. We are seeing explosions rather than implosions, a first in demolition history. 
A sequenced rumble becomes a roar as debris is thrown outward. The damage is not contained. Windows are blown from neighborhood buildings. What kind of energy enabled this? Would fire hurl metal and concrete sideways into the air? Here, a chunk of steel was flung 400 feet, wedging itself deep into Three World Financial Center on Vesey Street. A FEMA photographer taking pictures of Ground Zero wondered why so many steel beams were jutting from neighborhood buildings. Watt shot pieces of the towers all the way across the street. In fact, the portions of the tower that had the greatest structural members, the sky lobbies and the mechanical floors, had the perimeter units thrown farther than the perimeter wall units from the upper floors, which theoretically should have, because they're higher, they should have gone farther, right? No, these perimeter units landed on the winter garden 600 feet away. What about those floors, those pancakes? We're, we're, this is a pancake collapse. We're looking for some pancakes down below. This is a seven-story lobby. There's about two or three stories of stuff in there. We'll take a look at that stuff, but what I'm looking for is 110 floors with this kind of metal decking underneath four and five inches thick of concrete. An acre in size, each of them. 110 acres of these. How many floors do we find down at the bottom? Not 50, not 10, not even one. We don't even find metal decking down there or concrete. There's hardly any macroscopic chunks of concrete. What happened to the metal decking? What happened to the concrete? Pancakes occur in pancake collapses. Enormous pyroclastic clouds of pulverized concrete? Well, where is all the concrete, in fact? And you see, and there's no concrete. There's very little concrete. All you see is aluminum and steel. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized. And I was down here Tuesday, and it was like you were on a foreign planet. All of lower Manhattan, not just this site, from river to river, there was dust powder two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. And how about this firefighter? You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. The building collapsed to dust. And this dust made it almost across to New Jersey, across the river. Uh, thick, billowing, laying a carpet of four to six inches thick around lower Manhattan, uh, pulverized to uh, 100 micron to, to 10 mil particles, almost like talcum powder, some of it. It's uh, very, very fine. Where's the grinder that produced this? All of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction. And none of it can be accounted for by fire. How about that NIST report? We got $20 million in three years. What happened with our tax dollars? Their, their task was to determine how and why World Trade Center 1 and 2 collapsed and how and why World Trade Center 7 collapsed. Let's look at their objective. The focus of the investigation was on the sequence of events from the instant of aircraft impact to the initiation of collapse for each tower. For brevity in this report, this sequence is referred to as the probable collapse sequence. It doesn't actually include the structural behavior of the tower after the conditions for collapse initiation were reached and collapse became, they say, inevitable. Wait a minute. You're going to spend three years and $20 million and you're going to model every turbine in the airplane and you're going to stop the entire investigation before the real action begins, right when the point where you're going to stop at, at the point where the, the truss was sagging and pulling in the first column and, and you're just going to stop your, your, your analysis. How many engineers did you have working on this? And what are you concluding? This is, they have 10,000 pages in this report. This is the half page that explains everything after that. No analysis, 
Let's see their conclusion. The structure below the level of collapse initiation offered minimal resistance to the falling building mass at and above the impact zone. Structural engineers do this every day. Why didn't they do it? Could it be because they knew darn well that it would not have collapsed at all? Wait, what was the report title? Final report on the collapse of the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Probably should have called it Final Report on the Initiation of Collapse. They also cast doubt on their own theory. They say to us in a letter to our request for correction, which several of us applied for and have yet to see adequate results from, we are unable to provide a full explanation of the total collapse of the Twin Towers. Thank you. We think so too. Do we have expert corroboration? Well, here's Van Romero. It's too methodical to be a chance result of airplanes colliding with the structure, this explosive expert says. After the airplanes hit the World Trade Center tower, there were some explosives, in my opinion, inside the buildings that caused the towers to collapse. Mike Taylor, a demolition expert, looked like classic controlled demolition. Collapse of the Twin Towers mirrored the strategy used by demolition experts. How about this structural engineer, Ron Brookman? Explosive clouds of dust and debris moving horizontally and vertically upward as the collapse of World Trade Center 1 and 2 are just beginning does not look anything like a heat-induced gravitational collapse mechanism. William Rice, structural engineer also with Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. The prevailing theory would have us believe that each of the Twin Towers inexplicably collapsed upon itself, crushing all 287 massive columns on each floor while maintaining a free fall speed as if the 100,000 or more tons of supporting structural steel framework underneath didn't even exist. How about David Scott, structural engineer with AE 911 Truth? Near free fall collapse violates laws of physics. This suggests all the features of a classic controlled demolition with those exceptions which are atypical of classic controlled demolition. None of these features can be accounted for by fire, let alone all ten of them. It's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We got to get informed and inform every other architect and engineer that you can find and everybody else that you know. Support a new investigation. Why did we not see the truth about 9-11? Well, it appears as if our government lied to us about the building collapses. The 9-11 Commission report reinforced that lie. FEMA and NIST justified it. And the corporate media repeated it and they hammered it in. We really didn't have much of a chance. Now, we've shown here today that explosives were used to destroy each of the three World Trade Center high-rise buildings on 9-11. And it's known that it takes months of planning to set up and engineer and place these explosives. Do we think that Al-Qaeda had access to these highly secure buildings? The evidence you've seen tonight is just a small fraction of the vast body of information that the 9-11 Truth Movement has assembled. The questions raised are numerous and ominous that must be answered in a new investigation. I encourage you to discover the evidence that I have not had time to bring to you tonight. It will take thousands, perhaps millions of us. Each one of us, therefore, in this grassroots movement has an ultimate responsibility to take the information that we provided and disseminate it. Get the DVD. Loan it to everybody you know. You must become a truth bearer. Email the ae911truth.org link along with a statement saying, check this out to every architect and engineer you can find and everybody you know. We will turn heads in the halls of Congress. Sign the AE911truth.org petition. Sign it demanding a new investigation. Stand up and be counted. Everyone can sign. Architects, engineers, and all else. We have several categories of people. What you need to do is get one of these cards and we provide it. we got hundreds of architects. We stick our neck out on the line for you. Let them call us conspiracy theorists. All you have to do is say, hey, there's architects and engineers demanding a new investigation. What do you think? Support us by becoming a sustaining member. 
you can make a difference. We are a nonprofit organization that has our hands tied for lack of funds. We need to get the word out to the building professionals. For $10 a month, as little as that, you can become a sustaining member. Architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth are at the apex of the 9-11 Truth movement. Why? Because we have those who have the necessary credibility to raise eyebrows and gain attention. We need to get the vinyl banners, the DVDs, and the brochures into the hands of the real heroes of the 9-11 Truth movement, the people willing to get the message out on the street. We are change, truth action, project for a new American citizen. These folks need your support. We need to act. The power of truth is greater than the power of the lie. So get informed and begin to let the truth speak through you. And get informed with, through our website. You have all the information you need. Sign the petition here. Follow the red arrows. Become a sustaining member here. It's real easy. Given the numerous warnings of far worse terrorist attacks and war plans that are in place, we need to do something. Speak out, because a time comes when your silence is betrayal. Thank you so very much for your attention today.